Hello, welcome to those of you joining us. We're gonna get started in just a few moments. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you have joined a special National Farm to School Network open space focused on school and district run garden programs. Uh, we're really happy to have you here today. And it is a special opportunity for us. Uh, generally, our open spaces are restricted and, and strictly for our awesome core and supporting partners across the country. Um, but today we have decided to open up this dialogue and partner with the School Garden Support Organization Network as well and invite our two networks to come together um, for this really exciting topic. My name is Lacey Stevens and I'm the Program Manager with the National Farm to School Network and I'll be introducing you a little to the National Farm to School Network for those of you who may be joining us for the first time. Um, before I turn it over to our NFSN California supporting partner, John John Fisher of Life Lab to facilitate today's conversation. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping reminders. All of our participants are in listen-only mode right now. Uh, we will have lots of opportunity for dialogue and for our panelists and facilitator to answer your question. So as you have those questions, please enter those into the chat box. Um, and our panelists will be checking that chat box and responding to your questions as we move along. This uh, meeting and conversation will also be recorded and archived for future viewing and listening in the National Farm to School Network resource database. Um, so we'll also be able to share that recording with you in a follow-up email. So for those of you who might be joining um, from a different organization so who may not be familiar with Farm to School and the National Farm to School Network, I'm just going to set the stage a little bit. Um, when we at the National Farm to School Network talk about Farm to School, we're talking about these many different activities that support the connection that communities have with fresh, healthy foods and local food producers. And we know that this looks different in every community but it usually includes at least one of these core elements, as we like to call it, both local food procurement, gardening, and food and agriculture education. And as you can see here, gardening is one of those very key pieces to the farm to school puzzle. And at the National Farm to School Network, we are an information advocacy and networking hub for communities working to bring local food sourcing, school gardens, and food and agriculture education into schools and early care and education settings. So we work with our partners and communities all over the country to promote healthier food systems and healthier school and early care and environmental settings by enhancing food purchasing and education practices. So we are built on this network model, which includes our staff and advisory board, as well as over 200 core and supporting partner organizations in every state, in D.C., and in several of the territories. So these are incredible folks who are doing great farm to school work at that state and local level. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to tap into these local partners who you can find on our website at farmtoschool.org. We are also a member organization and we have over 20,000 network members across the country doing the great work of farm to school at many different levels. So we aim to do this work in advancing farm to school and farm to early care and education by acting as a hub for information, networking, and advocacy. So that means connecting people to resources uh, like the extensive resources we have available on our website and resource database in-person learning opportunities, virtual presentations and resources, and we ensure that everyone can build on these best practices and existing resources from our partners across the country. We also focus on connecting people to people through national network development and opportunities and also supporting our state partners and developing their own cross-sector networks, farm to school and farm to early care and education networks. And then the third area you focus around is connecting people to policy. So we work at federal, state, and local levels to advance farm to school supportive policies. 
So before I turn it over to John, I want to invite you, if you're interested in continuing this dialogue and conversation, to our next National Farm to Cafeteria Conference, which is taking place in Albuquerque, New Mexico, next April 21st to the 23rd. So this is a biennial event hosted by the National Farm to School Network that brings together over a thousand attendees from, the cost and from across the country to learn, network, and innovate with like-minded leaders. Registration will open in January, so keep your eye out for more information, and we hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue this important conversation with you. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John um, to continue our conversation today. John, you should be able to share your screen and take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lacey. I'm going to share a presentation here. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to share on the National Farm to School Networks platform uh, to share more widely about school gardens. And today we're going to focus on school district garden programs. So I represent an organization called the School Garden Support Organization Network, and we're a learning community of school garden support professionals. And we actually met at the Farm to Cafeteria Conference in 2012, the conference that Lacey was just mentioning. Um, and our goal is to create dialogue among school garden support organizations. Um, we are organizations that support more than one school garden. So that's how we define what an SGSO is or a school garden support org is. Um, we're supporting multiple school gardens and the way we operate as a mostly all volunteer network is we have a wonderful online forum where you can jump on and talk shop about topics related to supporting multiple school gardens. We have a webinar series. Uh, they're all archived on the sgsonetwork.org. Um, and here are some of the topics that we've covered and we're gonna continue with the 2020 webinar series um, related to school garden support organizations. We have created school garden support organizations best practice documents. So these are um, you know, uh, digital documents that share resources that SGSOs have created and that they use. Um, and something that we've added to our best practice documents are the district level model and resources. And I invite you, if you do operate a district level school garden program to jump on our website and we have a short form where you can share your district's website and briefly mention the sorts of resources that your organization provides to support multiple school gardens. And if you jump on our best practice document, you'll see some other school districts that are listed there already. Um, in addition to our digital communications, we do gather face-to-face -face with school garden support orgs. Uh, we mostly do that via other conferences. So for example, the Farm to Cafeteria Conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, will be creating a school garden support org unite uh, event, which will be an evening networking dinner. Um, we'll be having another SGSO Unite event at the American Horticulture Society's National Children and Youth Garden Symposium, which is going to be July 7th through 10th in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, something new that our network is quite excited about um, through the support of Sprouts Farmers Market, we're going to host the first National School Garden Leadership Summit, where we're going to have a national gathering strictly of school garden support orgs and that is slated to take place april 17th through 20th 2021 in denver colorado and we purposely put that on the off year cycle of the national farm to school networks farm to cafeteria conference so there's lots of ways to get engaged um, i encourage you to visit our website uh, we will be launching a new website in the weeks to come as well so today we're talking about school district garden programs. Um, I'll be sharing briefly about a program that my organization helps support. We have Jezra Thompson from the Berkeley Public Schools Program, Moses Thompson from Tucson Unified School District in the University of Arizona. And a little bit of introduction as part of our agenda. I'm gonna share the questions and encourage you to ask questions. We're gonna share our program summaries and then we're gonna have answers to our questions at the end. So, Let's start out here. Savannah is a testament here that uh, creating and sustaining school gardens is not an easy task. Um, this is the scenario of her clearing a corn patch in a school garden that I help manage. Um, and, and the reality though of school gardens is they're not necessarily easy to create and sustain. You know, gardens are 
are living instructional tools. They're quite unique. They rot and reproduce at the same time, and they depend on a high level of care to flourish. Um, schools, they'll have libraries and they'll have librarians. They'll have PE classes and they'll have PE teachers. They'll have school food systems and they'll have paid school food service staff. But gardens are a different scenario. They don't often come with paid staff. Um, we do know that people are the heart of school gardens and ideally those are paid garden coordinators or teachers that might be receiving an incentive or a stipend or invested administrators that could make things happen such as funding and budget lines. Um, but the reality school gardens do not uh, by definition have an institutional home or budget line uh, within a district or a school. So when we see gardens that thrive, uh, most often or, or very often we see them a part of a network or associated with the school garden support org. When we look at the organizations that are a part of our school garden support org network, we have about uh, 1600 school gardens that have registered and shared their organization type. Um, the bulk of the school garden support orgs that we communicate with are nonprofits. And then after that, we have school district entities. And of those about 400 school district entities, I would say over half of them are school food service departments and, and it's part of their farm to school program. And as you see, the line continues down college and university, for profit and other types of organizations, other defined government agencies, and then funders. Um, some of them consider them school garden support organizations. So our goal is to strengthen the work of school garden support orgs. And that's what we're gonna to do today by sharing some models of district level school garden programs. So here's a quick summary of um, some of the questions that you, the participants of this webinar, um, shared uh, when you registered for this webinar. Uh, the number one um, question you all had was, how do we fund people to support multiple school gardens or let alone just one school garden? Um, folks then were asking about oh, how, how are you instructing, who's doing the teaching, and how district department is your district-run school garden program housed? Those are some questions that we had. We had other questions about how do you train your staff that are working in your school gardens? Um, how do you get district buy-in and engagement? Um, how do you collaborate with the district? So these are questions that guided us in the case studies that we're going to share with you today. Um, and we do encourage you uh, to use the chat. And at any time that you want, just put in your questions. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on them. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to answer all of the questions um, as best as our ability. So use the chat, put in your questions. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on them. And at the end, um, we'll continue with answering your questions. So I'm gonna actually give one answer here to the question of funding. Um, just to wanna put this out here that the USDA and for those school districts that have a federal meal programs, the USDA has three memos that actually outline how school food service could use their dollars to support edible gardening activities. Um, their, their USDA memos, they go very in detail of clarifying how you can use your school food service dollars to support gardening and edible gardening activities. Um, it doesn't say that you're all in the black and have loads of money in your school food service. It doesn't say that your school food service director is willing to uh, allocate money for garden-based activities, but let it be known that the USDA does encourage you to use your school food service dollars to support your edible gardening programs. Um, some other ways that I've seen school districts get funded are through tax measures, and Berkeley will share a little bit about their sweetened beverage tax. Um, in Washington, D.C., they also have a sweetened beverage tax that funds their farm to school activities and school garden grant program. In Santa Cruz, we have a parcel tax where we vote like, yes, on Measure P, it's for the schools. And within that money that is taxing um, property owners to um, in better our schools and our community, there's a line for garden science instructors. And so we have two school districts actually in Santa Cruz that have part-time paid garden coordinators. So if there is a will, there is a way, um, and hopefully we'll be able to share some ideas today um, related for funding that might be relevant for your program. 
Um, I'm going to talk about the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, our school gardens are ran by two entities, one nonprofit partner, myself, Life Lab, and then the extended learning or after school program runs after school gardening program. So I'll go a little bit more into detail on these programs. So first of all, Life Lab is a 40 year old nonprofit. We cultivate children's love of learning and healthy food nature through garden-based education. We run field trip programs at two sites. We publish and sell curriculum. We help um, run this national SGSO network. We give trainings on our site and we have um, trainings that we put on the road. And, and that's one way I've connected with the folks in Berkeley and Arizona today. We've, we've collaborated with them and provided trainings. Um, and then we also have our own SGSO in our region. We support our county-wide gardens and then we have direct service in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. So the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is in Southern Santa Cruz County. If you eat strawberries or lettuce, most likely they're coming from the ag businesses in Southern Santa Cruz County, um, Driscoll Berries headquartered there. And our students um, are the children of the farm workers that are growing much of the food that we're eating across the United States. So hardworking um, farm worker families um, comprise the bulk of our 20,000 student school district. There's three high school, five middle schools, and 11 of our 16 elementary schools have gardens with paid staff. And there's a mix of the type of programming that happens there. So uh, four of our schools have both after school staff and school day garden program staff. Four of our sites have just after school programming with paid staff. Three of them have school day only programs and those are through the Life Lab partnership. And then there is a middle school that has paid after school program staff. The way our, op our programs operate um, in our school day programs, once again, it's with the nonprofit partner Life Lab. We have five staff, four of them are AmeriCorps members. In the spring and fall, we provide kinder through second grade NGSS science. Um, it is something the district was interested in. So we're providing NGSS science lessons to our students. They get about eight to 10 lessons per year. And during the winter months when it's a little cold, colder and wet out, um, we go into the classroom and provide or classroom cooking for the third through fifth grade classes. And those are 90 minute classes. Um, and we're at about 95% uh, participation rate of all of our schools on average. So most of our schools are at 100% participation rate, meaning all of the classes are participating in these programs. How do we fund this? Through grants and foundations. So it's soft money. Um, unlike our uh, after school program, this is actually the district's program. Through, through the extended learning program, they run after school programs. The bulk of the schools that we work with in Watsonville in South Santa Cruz County um, have very robust after school programs. And the way they operate their programs students get to participate in a 10-week cooking and nutrition class um, once a week and they spend an hour um, working in the garden and then they cook and eat something right out in the garden. Um, they're funded through an ACES grant um, and a 21st century grant um, and the ACES grant stands for After School Education and Safety Program and that's a statewide grant for California and that funds five part-time people that manage their um, nine after school garden programs. Extended learning also runs summer school programming. Um, many of our kids um, participate in our summer school program and summer feeding program and the extended learning program operates those. So how do we integrate with the district? So Life Lab, um, one of our roles was to help create the district's environmental literacy plan, which helped dictate what kind of science they wanted to focus on. So that was a really great entry to the district, which we started doing that work before we actually had our school garden program. Um, our NGSS lessons are science lessons and we focus on English literacy skills because about 75% of our students are English language learners. And so we're focusing on the district's emphasis in developing English literacy skills. Um, and we also have a tie in with school food service. Uh, one of our service members, our AmeriCorps service members, she shares her time with school food service due to cafeteria promotions and help coordinate the salad bar program. Extended learning staff, 
Um, in addition to running their garden programs, they're running a fitness for life. So they're doing a fitness for life program, which is bicycling and swimming and physical activity. Um, and the staff member that oversees that also runs their fresh fruit and veggie program, which is a federal program that provides funds to give snacks, fresh fruit and vegetable snacks during non-lunch time. And we have eight schools that participate in that. And we, we partner um, through that program, we partner with our food bank and we provide 1500 pounds of food assistance distributed through our gardening programs per week and I already mentioned that we have a summer school program so that's a quick summary of um, what we do in Pajaro Valley we do do assessments um, through our NGSS program and our kids cook test program um, you can see those at our life lab partner schools page um, we found out that 60% of our kids are trying fruits and vegetables for the first time that's just one little piece of information that we get from our assessment um, and I'm gonna close here with our keys to success. Communicate widely and often. So talk to as many entities within the district um, that have any kind of engagement in student learning. So academic services is where we created our environmental literacy plan and dictated how we we're gonna um, do science instruction based on what the district was interested in. Um, all of our school sites, we have really great communication channels and we have to customize all of our scheduling around every school bell schedule. And so that takes a lot of communications. Um, and then we have relationships with administrators, the superintendent, the grant writer, the public information officer. Um, we're always sharing how our program's going, inviting them to garden tours. Um, and last but not least, teamwork makes the dream work. Seek as many partnerships and collaborations. For example, our food bank collaboration that the extended learning program runs is a great one. All right, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jezra Thompson who manages the Berkeley Unified School District Gardening and Cooking Program. Hi, I'm so thrilled to be here and to share our Berkeley Unified School District model my name is Jezra Thompson and I lead this program here in Berkeley. I'm actually in the middle there in black with a fun cast on, which is thankfully no longer on, but this is our team. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly outline all that we do and how we're funded and try to answer some of the questions that um, John has pre-posed. Next, please. So, thank you. So we are a small uh, urban school district. We are in the Bay Area. And so we are like San Francisco and Oakland and our neighbors, we are slowly um, becoming more affluent, which has changed some of our demographics and some of our services. We have a total of 19 schools, three preschools, 11 elementary schools, three middle schools, one really large high school, one really small high school, and then an adult school. And in total, we're, we're quite small compared to the other presenters um, and many other schools. We're about 10,000 students. Most of our schools don't qualify for free reduced price meals. So federal funding that we once had, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, is no longer even a viable option for us. We're about 32% white, but we are still a very diverse school district. We have uh, 40 languages spoken in our schools, but we have a high success rate in graduation. Just to kind of frame you and ground you in um, our school district and where, and where we're at. Next. So my program that I lead, uh, the Gardening Cooking Program, out of those 19 schools, we serve uh, 17 of those schools. So we have a school garden in all of those schools, um, except for our large high school and our adult school, but we do programming there in other capacities. One of those programs that we lead in our high schools is the Career Technical Education Program. This is a new program that we started, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in my next couple of slides, but this is how we serve our two high schools uh, with joint funding and joint partnerships. We've been able to reintroduce our kitchen classrooms at four of our schools, two of our middle schools, and then two after school programming. Two of our middle schools have a full on kitchen classroom that teaches to full um, classes. And then we have an after school program that we work in partnership with our after school extended learning. We are uh, fully staffed. All of our school gardens are staffed by educators. Um, John mentioned that you know, PE, PE is staffed by um, a teacher, libraries are staffed by coordinators, gardens are often not staffed by uh, a steward. We have stewards that not only maintain the gardens, but they also instruct in the gardens, they coordinate with the sites, 
and the teachers. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we actually teach and what we actually teach. So we are all classified. We're not teachers, which is an interesting uh, specific um, position. If, you're, if you are working within schools or with schools, the classification is an important thing. And I'll talk more about that in my last slide of lessons learned. We are centrally located. I'm a central office and I have a support of half-time program specialists. And we support um, the staff at the many different sites, as well as uh, direct curriculum and assessments, maintain funding, and make sure that the coordination and communication is on point with the district. Next, please. This is a brief uh, program outline just to show where we were and how we got to where we are now because we are in a huge place of privilege right now. Like many of you um, who operated a school garden program, whether you're a nonprofit or a public entity or a school district, you probably got some funding from SNAP Ed before 2012. And you probably lost that funding about at 2012. We were fully funded for about nine or 10 years with that SNAP Ed uh, funding that really focused on farm to school efforts. And we lost that in 2012 as well. We are also housed within the nutrition services, like it seemed like uh, a lot of you were, according to that bar graph that was really fun to see that John presented. When we lost that money, we had to really rethink and restructure who we're serving, how we're serving, and um, how often. So we got moved to uh, the education services, and we got tasked with not only talking about nutrition and environmental ed, but also um, helping the district close the achievement gap, helping support equity um, as opposed to just equality, especially considering that we no longer qualify under many of the federal grants, we had to really diversify our budget. This was also around the same time that the community really rose to the occasion and started the campaign for the soda tax. We were one of the first cities um, besides DC who operated a different soda tax, but we were the first city that actually was able to pass a soda tax. And part of that campaign language when folks knocked on the door was that this was going to be supporting a program that they beloved, that lost its funding, and a lot of folks knew about us from that space and time. And so we were able to help pass that tax in that capacity. The tax got passed. Um, thankfully, and we were then uh, able to apply to a grant. The tax is, has, is housed within the um, Berkeley City Public Health Department. I do a grant every year, but we also have to report on how we spend this money. And we do, I do a lot of different communications with the commission that advises on how to spend this money. I do presentations to the city council and the school district council to make sure that what we are doing is what we said we are doing. And this is where the curriculum and assessments come into play. In about 2015, when we got this new money, we really needed to start showcasing how we're doing it and what we're doing. We went through this rigorous process of curriculum development that I'll talk a little bit about in my next couple of slides and the importance of that. And then we were able to use that as a communication tool to continue to apply to the grant. And now we have a, our first two year grant for um, almost a million dollars. An important part of this grant is that there's a stipulation that requires the district to come into matching funds. So we're never going to be reliant upon a single source funding. We're always going to have diversified funding between the school district, which has to put in funding, which means that they now have a little bit more skin in the game. And we're now also held accountable to sharing the lift of our teachers to support our students and in, in, uh, teachers in learning. We've also brought in some new programming that I'll uh, share a little bit more about. Next slide, please. Like I said, we, are, um, we have a garden-based learning program. We are uniquely positioned. We have a school garden in every school. This is different than when we had our 1.9 million fully funded program that was only funding programs that qualified under free and reduced price meals. We're now funding school gardens in every school and we have staff funded at every school. They are tasked with maintaining the gardens. They are tasked with using our curriculum and instructing um, every student, every class is out with a, with a teacher in full classes. And they are out in the garden every other week from elementary school to fifth grade. And we teach sixth and seventh grade garden education tied to electives and science classes. 
so we have a strong relationship with our teachers and our principals. Next slide, please. We are an urban environment, which means that our school gardens look different depending on the site. It's important for us to maintain flexibility and to build partnerships, not just with our school sites, but also with our facilities department. You can see in this slide, we've got different gardens, whether they are just gardens built on the side next to a playground, whether they're planter boxes next to a playground or a broad courtyard garden. Um, we have many different gardens that we are able to develop and work from. And they're not necessarily food producing gardens, they are teaching environments. So they've got mainly um, teaching plants that are connected to our curriculum for seed dissection and flower dissection. Our facilities department um, supports us with uh, irrigation, uh, building beds, fence maintenance, mulching, weed whacking, um, and even various uh, special projects. And this wasn't always the case. We have built up relationships with not just those that are serving on the ground, but also with the directors in charge of facilities. And that has grown over time through um, many different relationships and conversations that I've been able to have with them so that they could become more um, uh, part of our, our collective team. Next slide, please. We're super proud of our K through five garden based learning curriculum. We worked really hard on this um, in about 2015 when we had to demonstrate how we are actually serving the whole child and, and uh, helping to close the achievement gap. Each lesson is connected to NGSS, um, environmental and nutrition education, as well as English language learner activities. We didn't just create this um, on our own. We gleaned from existing resources because we're all doing this work together. Um, agencies like Life Lab and the Botanical Garden here at Cal, um, our instructional lessons that we've been teaching over the many years when we had the single source funding, we were able to combine all of those lessons and then really think about how we were teaching them within the classroom minutes. Many of our schools only have 45 minutes uh, instructional time and we had to teach within that 45 minutes. We also had to teach every other week to build in a, a FTE to then get a staff equation. So we really considered all of these different factors when creating and publishing our curriculum. So I really encourage you to go onto our website and download these uh, curriculum lessons. They're grouped by grade cluster. They're free for download and they're really structured for a school district. They've got a lot of practicality and we have com a compatible workbook that I'm gonna be posting on there as well. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna to talk too much about our cooking program because I know that this webinar is really focused on supporting garden-based education, but it's important to consider other types of programming outside of the garden when considering um, interests and goals that the district may have, as well as funding interests. Since we do get part of the soda tax, it's important for us to affect consumption and behavior change and to really look at um, our healthy food access and our culturally relevant lessons so that we could teach to our direct population. So we have four kitchen classrooms. Um, we teach four consecutive weeks in our after school and our middle schools. We use a curriculum that we have built with the same method of gleaning, modeling, um, assessing, editing, and then practicing. We try to publish these curriculums every two years to stay flexible and relevant. So you can look for our second um, edition of our garden-based learning curriculum on our website. We'll be publishing a new edition of our cooking and nutrition curriculum soon this summer. Um, but please take advantage of that website download. Uh, we, have, we directly support um, changing behaviors and introducing um, new fruits and vegetables. Next slide, please. At these sites that we provide additional nutrition and cur curriculum and instruction, at, in addition to our garden, we do family cooking events. We have six cooking events every year um, total at all of these sites. These are great opportunities for our families to not just engage in what we're teaching their kids and to showcase 
their children's um, leadership abilities and sharing what they're learning, but it's also an informal communication space. We're able to have conversations with our families at these events about things that really matter to them and have more intimate conversations to um, share resources on how to make healthy food ch choice changes. We do a lot of rigorous assessments. And one of our questions that we ask at the end of every family night is how did this class influence your perception on what you eat? Um, do, you, do you learn how to read a food label? And is that going to give you, is that an extra tool to help you make a, a different choice? And many of them said yes. 37 is not a huge percent, but it is when you're thinking about change making. That usually happens over a five or 10 year span. Next, please. We're able to support a career technical education and public health program at our high schools. This is a jointly funded program and it's also jointly managed by myself and the career technical education coordinator. We are able to pool our resources to pay a teacher, not a classified staff, but a teacher, a CTE teacher to teach public health in um, our Berkeley High School, which is a very large campus. We're also able to fund student interns. So um, my program pays for these students, in addition to their coursework, to go into the community and work on public health projects and get paid for their time. These projects are directly connected to what they're learning. We're, pri we're trying to provide opportunities in career and college track around public health particularly. And we're really focusing on those underserved students within our high schools. We're able to partner with our local food bank as well to provide a food pantry about twice a month at both of our high schools with these student interns and our teachers in charge. Our food pantry is also available for the community to access at, all our, at our, our alternative high school space. So that's a great way of getting the word out, talking about what we're doing, also uplifting our student leaders um, in those spaces. Next, please. Since we are district employees, it's important for us to participate in district professional development. Um, Regardless if we are district employees or not, we all need to maintain a growth mindset in this work. Like our gardens, we are ever evolving and want to stay connected to the trends, the new student body, um, the different changing needs. Um, so we do a lot of professional development that's directly catered to staff. Since we are centrally uh, located, my office is um, centralized and I have staff that are itinerant at all the sites. We're able to not just respond to the district demands and goals for closing the achievement gap, but I'm also able to provide professional development that is directly to that. We've had Life Lab come out on a couple of occasions training us on how to use science um, lessons in the garden, how to um, talk about full inclusion, and we're working on trauma-informed education in the garden and the kitchen classrooms. We have this unique opportunity because we're built within the school district to really um, hear what's happening in the school district and apply it to our own learning environments. Next, please. The burning question, how is this all funded? Um, we are primarily funding staff salary and benefits with um, this really large city grant that's funded by the soda tax, almost a million dollars a year, which requires the district to put in a base level of 300,000 every year. So this is the total budget that we're working with annually. Keep in mind, we not only fully staff all of our gardens, that includes prep time, materials maintenance, it includes our, our student interns, our professional development trainers. Um, we also do a lot of hourly work so that folks can do additional professional development. And considering everything that we do for a school district, this is not a huge budget annually. And we're really able to affect change quite broadly. Next slide, please. Some quick outline lesson learns. Um, since our evolution, if you recall that last slide of you know, 2012 to where we are currently, there's been a huge learning curve. Going from a single source funding 
and focused on nutrition education to go into a diversified funding and focused on whole child development and closing the achievement gap. Diversifying your budget, not relying solely on one is important. Also understanding that as a school entity, we cannot have soft money to fund staff salary and benefits. We need to have consistent funding from the district and from a consistent uh, grant like the city of Berkeley soda tax. We are all union contracts. Um, we cannot hire and fire as in the same fashion as if we were not a public entity. So that's really important to understand when you're trying to build in a sustainable program for schools. Centralizing your uh, management has been a real opportunity for us because we're able to connect to the needs and collaborate with those that are um, directing the entire school district, share those with each site, while also relying heavily on um, staff at sites to connect to the teachers and the principals to make sure that what we're doing is relevant. People power is how we do this work. Um, without a strong staff that is um, provided with relevant and asked for professional development, we cannot do this work. My team has been incredible. They've been incredible teachers um, at sites. They're often the source for um, students that don't traditionally learn in the classroom. They often thrive in our spaces. And so I put a lot of energy and a lot of extra support in building and uplifting um, staff, which has been incredibly important. We'll hear more about um, different supports, including AmeriCorps, Cal interns that we also draw from, and volunteers. It's important to think about many different staffing options, not just um, classified or certificated. These are just a few um, brief lessons learned that I want to share with you. Please go onto our website, um, reach out if you have any additional questions. I'm always happy, happy to have a conversation if you are trying to model a district-wide program. Thank you so much for letting me share our Berkeley Unified School District model with you. All right, thank you, Jezra. So we're gonna pass it on to Moses Thompson from the Tucson Unified School District and the University of Arizona. Um, just wanna make it be clear again that both their websites are listed on the sgsonetwork.org website under best practices, and you could dig into a lot of the resources that they're sharing. For example, Jezra's curriculum is posted there and Moses also has lessons, but I'm gonna pass it on to Moses to share about their program. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Moses Thompson and I am an associate director with the University of Arizona Community and School Garden Program. Um, I also am a certified K-12 school counselor and have been working as a school counselor for the past 15 or 16 years. Um, go ahead, next slide. Just to put the program uh, that we run in context, um, we're in Tucson, Arizona. We're a large public school district. Um, Arizona is at the bottom when it comes to funding per pupil. Um, so I think that we're a good case study for um, uh, low income schools, kind of poverty stressed schools and schools um, that are underfunded by the state. Um, we serve more than 40,000 students um, across the district. More than 60% of our kids are at free and reduced lunch. Um, we are mostly um, serve a Mexican American population um, and we support about 70 school gardens across the district. Um, the map that I put up um, kind of shows a phenomenon that's not, that's not just unique to Tucson, but I think it's very important. And what it does is it shows how academic performance clusters by um, by socioeconomic status and how it um, clusters by race. And so you see all of the A, rate, all of the A rated schools are in the foothills of Tucson um, and then the C and D schools in Central and South Tucson. And that's really where we um, direct a lot of our efforts on. Um, most of the school gardens that we support have a uh, free and reduced lunch rate in the 80 to 90% range. Next slide. So program history. Um, I think that what I'm trying to show with this slide is that we had 
two kind of grassroots efforts that evolved at the same time and then merged in about 2014. And so in the Tucson Unified School Districts, um, schools kind of caught fire, school gardens caught fire. And we saw school gardens developing um, across the district as kind of independent siloed off um, little side projects. And at the same time at the University of Arizona, um, there were undergrad and graduate students who became interested in supporting um, that movement and they began, began to take independent study classes at, at uh, university in the School of G. Um, I started my program as the school counselor focusing on social and emotional outcomes in 2006. Um, and in 2012, um, the program kind of went on the radar at the district level. Then in 2014, the university and the school district partnered around my position and created a joint funded position for me. And so right now, Half of my funding comes from TUSD Food Services, and the other half of my funding comes from the University of Arizona. And what we've been able to do is then take these two big organizations and create a single unified program where both of these big institutions play nicely together. Go ahead, next slide. So what does our program look like? Um, on the Tucson Unified side, we have five people that are funded um, by Tucson Unified Food Services. And so that's all hard funding. Um, we do, we, we, we support infrastructure, we write grants, we do food literacy um, and, guard, and garden to cafeteria work. And then at the U of A, we have an additional five staff. Two of us at the university side are on hard funding. We have to fundraise for, for the other folks. Um, we also has, have two teaching assistants that come along with the school garden class. Um, that we teach. And so down at the bottom, I have on the Tucson Unified Professional Development, and then on the U of A side, I have the school garden class. And these are really the big institutional things that both sides of our partnership offer. So on the, the professional development side, um, we are Tucson Unified School District professional development. So teachers come to us on paid time during their required professional development time. They get recertification credit um, for going and so teachers can opt in with us and do PDs out in the garden um, as opposed to going to you know going to a library somewhere and watching a PowerPoint for an hour. Um, on the U of A side the school garden class is the heartbeat of that program and so through that class um, we train about a hundred students per year that then serve um, about 9,000 service hours um, in 25 of, of the Title I schools that are in the Tucson Unified Network. So we're training teachers on the school side, we're training university uh, students on the university side, and then we, and then we put them together. Um, I think one thing on the university uh, side with the class that's really important to mention is that um, the class formalizes that volunteer relationship. And so the students earn a grade, there's benchmarks, there's training, so the schools get high quality um, service and um, they, get, they get support that they can count on. Okay, next slide. Um, so the program sustainability and collab collaboration, on the, like I said, on the district side, the, the folks with skin in the game is TUSD Food Services and they fund about five people. One of them is a grant writer and so we're raising money on the Tucson Unified side. And then at the university, it's the School of Geography and Development. The other thing that I would say um, that I think is important to kind of the flavor of the programming that we offer, um, with my background in counseling, there, we really have a hard emphasis on social emotional learning. And then on the U of A School in Ge of Geography and Development, um, the director that comes from that program, Sally Marston, is a feminist geographer and a social scientist. And so, I feel like those, those two things um, kind of permeate all of the professional development and programming and curriculum writing that we do. Um, for me, my, my background is coming out of the Tucson Unified School District um, as a K-12 educator. And so I think that once we partnered with the university, that gave us fiscal sponsorship through the university. Um, and this was really critical to um, I think the, the outcomes that we're able to get as a program. Um, the university as an institution is built for fundraising and has all of the mechanisms 
to raise money and administer money well. And so by being a university program, we have 501c3 status through the foundation. Um, our team members on the university side have purchasing cards. Um, we have a business manager that manages all of our finance. That's all institutional support that comes from the university. Um, like I said, I come from the, the district, and so I'm used to having to do requisitions and purchase orders where turnaround time can be more than a month. I'm used to only being able to purchase from TUSD approved vendors. All of that red tape really jams up um, dynamic programs. And so both worlds by being both university and district. Okay, next slide. Um, I mentioned this before, the, uh, the institutional stuff we do at the district side. We do monthly professional development where teachers come to us on the clock, they get paid to do it, and they have to do it for their certification anyway. So we, we do about 50 teachers once a month. There's a waiting list to get in. Um, it's really been great. Um, the other thing I would say is we've done curriculum development for a long time, um, but we've noticed that curriculum development while it's good, um, really, it, for us, it wasn't getting at the cultural change at the school sites um, that we were trying to get, but doing regular increments of professional development where two or more teachers from each school site comes in gardening chop relationships and they start to network between schools. This really gets at that cultural change that gives school gardens staying power. Um, another part of the, the Green Academy is we have a Green Academy leadership team. They're K-12 teachers. They're kind of our rock star garden teachers. We give them a stipend. They direct all of the professional development that we do. Um, oh, I think you're going the wrong direction. Keep going. Next slide. Here we go. So measuring and sharing impact, we, um, we prioritize um program evaluation and so we have a commitment where we do program ev evaluation every three or four years and this is a funding priority for us and so we are always working to cultivate private donors to grant right um, reaching out to foundations knowing that every three or four years we want some money that we can do program evaluation um, the other kind of cool thing about the program evaluation that we do because we have access through the university um, we take graduate students and we train them to do a lot of the, the evaluation work for us. And this is a cost savings, but it also is enriching the experience of these university students. So they go out into the schools, um, they survey teachers, students, parents, um, other university students do interviews, focus groups, they collect all the data, and then we usually work with researchers that then aggregate and synthesize that data for us. Um, here's a little snapshot of some of the quantitative and qualitative things that we measure. Um, it's really interesting, like I said before, I think the background, uh, my background is a counselor. There is actual scientist, you see a lot of social and emotional outcomes re reported across K-12 students, K-12 teachers, and K-12 interns. Okay, next slide. Um, the secret sauce, what do I think, uh, how do we do this stuff? Um, in Tucson, like I said, most of the students we serve are Mexican American. We also are working on the traditional lands of the Tahana Autumn people. And so finding those cultural connections to the community um, is something that's been really critical to the success of our programs. Um, I think all of our stuff evolved from um, the grassroots. This is not a university program that was conceptualized on a campus and then parachuted into to outside communities, that these are on the ground teachers all of our school gardens look different. All the programming looks different. What we do from the university side is we train an intern workforce to go out and support those grassroots efforts. Um, the fiscal sponsorship, like I said, is really important. The consistent PD, multiple people per site, and then a long period of time, that's what gets at that cultural change. Um, the other thing we try to prioritize is depth over breadth. We're not trying to put a garden in every school and we're not trying to spread laterally. What we're trying to do is find those really rich programs and people and support them uh, in an ongoing way. And I think that's it. Awesome, Moses, thank you. Wow, thank you, Jezra and Moses and the National Farm School Network to give us this opportunity 
to share. We have about eight to 10 minutes left and we are gonna get into some of the questions that you posed in the chat. Uh, the first questions I'm going to kind of group together. They were about teacher engagement. Are the teachers engaged when the lessons are being taught or are they just bystanders? Um, related to that is how do you get high participation rates for your classes to come out and participate in your garden programs? And even more related to that is how do you get continued engagement over time? Like after the excitement of the garden comes, how do you keep people coming out year after year? And I'll briefly answer that quickly. In our program, teachers come out and we try to engage them, but it depends on how good our educator is in drawing that teacher in to support the lesson. So we train our educators to purposely pull the teachers in so they can help. Some teachers are more engaged than others. Um, how do we get high participation rate? In our program, like the proof is in the pudding. Like after one year of running the program, everybody's asking for it for the next year. So it just kind of happens through osmosis. And then continued engagement over time, it happens through that communication. Um, and just making sure the schools know like, hey, we're back, we're running this program again. And once again, it travels through osmosis. So I wanna pass this question on to uh, Moses and then Jezra. How do you keep continued engagement among your teachers and your program over time? Yeah, like I said, that's, that's really what I'm trying to get at when I talk about um, transforming the culture of a school where it's beyond just a teacher or two and it's beyond just a side project where the garden is pervasive on campus and the garden and the way that the families and kids value that garden can outlive uh, teacher turnover and administrative turnover. And for us, it's really been that consistent teacher training over a long period of time. Um, where the teachers get to get, in the, get into the garden when the kids aren't around and get into the garden when their principal's not around and kind of build their confidence level um, for being in the garden, but also experience those same outcomes that we want for our kids. Teachers tell us when they're in the garden, they feel less stressed. They feel like they can self-manage better. They feel a connection to nature. And so all of that, that those good feelings that the garden brings out in K-12 kids, when the teachers kind of catch hold of that, and it starts happening to multiple groups of teachers and those relationships form, and they form relationships with teachers doing the same stuff at other schools. Um, for us, that's where the, the staying power with, with teachers and programs has been. Great, and Jezra, we'll, you can hop off mute and share. So when we lost all of our funding um, in 2012, we had to do this big push of talking about what and how we are doing now that we are in, in housed in ed services. And this is the importance of the curriculum and assessment um, from our perspective in terms of building it into a district. Um, when I presented the program with the curriculum and the assessments to the school board, they voted to make it a mandated program. So schools don't have options to opt out. Um, I build FTE for staff based on how many classes are in each school including prep time and teacher collaboration time. So the garden program is not at the whim of whether a teacher wants to bring their class out or not. And that has been afforded to us, not just because of the different communications and now the report, also because we for so many years before 2012, where we could build in a lot of those relationships. So we were really set up to succeed in that place. Um, since teacher collaboration time is built into the FD with my staff, they are having to collaborate with the teachers on exact lessons to align the goals. It looks different in different classroom spaces depending on how engaged the teacher is. We also do training on full inclusion and trauma-informed education and different strategies to really engage all learners um, from that disadvantage, which then demonstrates that we are supporting the teacher goals. So that's how we're able to get the buy-in from the district and, and the teachers and make sure that, that collaboration actually happens. Great, we got a, time for a couple more questions. One quick, easy one. Someone asked, will this be archived and accessible at a later date? Yes, it will be at the Farm to uh, Schools website and the sgsonetwork.org's website. We'll archive these webinars. Um, another question here was, who writes your curriculum? In our case at Life Lab, it's Life Lab staff that's writing NGSS lessons. And we're doing that based on the influence of our district's environmental literacy plan and communication with the district science coordinator. Moses? Um, who, yeah, we pay, we pay our best teachers to do it. 
that's a very common model I've seen as well. It's great. And Jezra, who, who put your curriculum together? We gleaned a lot of resources, vetted it with all of my staff, and then moving forward when we make additions and we do kind of this backwards design, I work with Cal and I also pay our best teachers on staff, my staff, as well as our classroom teachers to work over the summer on updating it so it's more relevant. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a common thread there of an empowering, engaging, rewarding your best teachers and engaged garden educators to be the ones that could take their knowledge and passion of using the garden and turning it into lessons for others in your district. That's a really great model. Okay, we'll end with one last question about assessment. Does anybody have any assessment tips? And then they asked a question about how we get that um, number of kids at Life Lab who uh, state it's the first time they've tried a fruit or veggie. So every time we do a cooking program, we have a tasting element where they take sticky dots and put it on a column like, yes, I like it, not today, or I tried it and maybe tomorrow I'll like it sort of thing where they vote. But before they taste, we have by a show of hands, uh, how many is it the first time you've had a, a raw cucumber? And they just raise their hand and we count how many hands out of the total number of the classroom. And that's how we do kind of a straw poll of first time trying a fruit or veggie. So anybody else, Moses um, and Jezra, tips on running assessment for your program? Um, what you said, we do similar things. I think something different that we do is, um, again, with our connection with the university is tap into uh, graduate students looking to do research as, as like thesis or um, dissertation work. And we had a really great, I had a graduate student back when I was um, doing gardening as a, as a full-time school counselor and they did an assessment on school stress as it relates to um, touches with the garden. And so they were, the student was coming in and doing uh, school stress inventories with schools, with kids school wide, and then also keeping track of minutes that those students spent in the garden and found a really strong uh, correlation between um, minutes in the garden and lowered school stress. And so, um, yeah, I think university students some kind, sometimes, especially if they have to do it as a part of their program, can bring creative things and it doesn't cost money. Thank you, and Jezra. So part of our grant with the city of Berkeley that's tied to the soda tax is rigorous results-based accountability. So I work with their researchers to develop assessments that we then try out in our nutrition and garden programs. So I asked for my staff feedback on these exact surveys. We do a pre and post survey at the end of four week rotations. And this gives us data to showcase how we're actually affecting change over the years. Um, we also are able to work with different uh, Cal researchers that wanna do special projects to look at the consumption patterns base level and the consumption patterns over the years. But I really love uh, Moses's idea of connecting more with the university to do additional assessments on things that are much harder to measure, like stress in the school gardens, because that is going to be a great tool to advocate for the continuation of this work. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank all you participants. Mm -hmm. Once again, this will be archived. We'll take a, a screenshot of your questions and put them in um, the archive on the sgsonetwork.org website. And I just want to say most of the questions you've asked, we, there are solutions. Everything that the resources that you're looking for, there has been some school garden organization or entity that has addressed those questions that you have. So engage in our forum, engage in our face-to-face -face gatherings, check out the farm to school resource library. Um, the, the, the answers are there. Sometimes it's hard to find them. So thank you for educating yourselves and sharing with us on this presentation. And we look forward to connecting with you face to face or on a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you, John, Moses, and Jezra. Um, this is Lacey with National Farm to School Network and want to let you know that we'll send out a follow-up email with uh, the recording and we hope to see you in uh, Albuquerque next year. Thanks so much, John, Jezra, and Moses for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.